Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Robin Ginet, and uh, with my colleagues, uh, Juliette Cognac and uh, Lohan Guérin, we are happy to present you uh, our, uh, this, for this workshop uh, a topic on uh, adaptation of climate change uh, of rice in the Mekong River Delta. So we'll give a few words of context on the region, on the natural hazards and climate change that will uh, influence rice cropping systems, and then uh, my colleagues will review the adaptation strategies uh, for this crop. So, uh, first of all, where are we? So, the Mekong is a big Asian river which crosses several countries, and actually it ends up in Vietnam. Uh, this is the Mekong Delta, a map of the Mekong Delta. It's an area of 4 million hectares. It's, it's very flat, and uh, there are 17 million people living here, so it's really a uh, quite high population density. And uh, this region accounts for 56% of the national rice production and 90% of the exports. And it's quite small compared to the size of Vietnam, so it's really a critical region. It's the heart of rice production in Vietnam. Uh, it's mostly small-scale farming, I would say family-scale farming, um, but uh, there was a green revolution uh, in the 60s and 70s and also economic reforms called the Doi Moi in, the, in 1986. So it's not really traditional agriculture. A lot of hydraulic infrastructures have been built and people have been pushed towards a quite intensive form of agriculture. So it's, it's family scale farming, but quite modern farming. Um, now, what about the climate? Uh, it's in the south of Vietnam, so it's a tropical monsoon climate with an average monthly temperature ranging from 27 to 29 degrees. In terms of precipitation, it's very high, around 2,000 millimeters per year, and roughly three quarters of it are between June and November, which is <clears throat> the rainy season. And uh, of course, between December and May, then it's the dry season. And traditionally, uh, people would grow two uh, rice in a year, a winter paddy from November to March, March roughly, and a spring paddy from a March to a July, August. And uh, with the intensification of agriculture, like uh, I, uh, in the rainy season, you see it's also a typhoon and a flood season. And so these extreme events, especially the floods, were making rice cultivation very difficult. And so, but recently people have built high dikes around the fields to protect them from the floods. And so this allowed to do a third rice in the year, the autumn paddy. So you can see that, no, I mean, it's not all farmers who have this system, but a lot of farmers have three rice in a year, which is a really intensive system. Um, now let's move into climate change. Uh, in this region, we observed already a past climate change of plus 0, 060 something degrees. Uh, and in the future, for the next 50 years, we can expect uh, plus 1.3 to plus 2.6 degrees. Uh, depending on the IPCC scenarios, which is quite high. And uh, more interestingly, uh, it's the precipitation pattern. You can see that for the same period, we can expect a likely increase of precipitation during the rainy season of plus 250 millimeters somehow, and a decrease of precipitation of minus 100 something in the dry season. Uh, so this means that climate change should exacerbate the differences between these two seasons, with a dry season being more dry and a, a wet season becoming more wet. So we can also expect a likely increase of droughts and of floods in these respective seasons. Uh, now, another aspect of climate change, which is very critical for this region, of course, is sea level rise, because the average altitude of the Mekong Delta is 0 0.8 meter and with plus one meter of sea level rise which is roughly what we can expect for uh, 2100 2, uh, up to 75 percent of the delta could be below sea level uh, at that date according to this study so uh, i will explain later why it's uh, important but you can imagine there is a problem and uh, also in terms of extreme events we can expect a likely increase of intensity and or frequency of extreme events such as heat waves, floods, typhoons. And also we can expect an increase in the intensity 
of El Nino related hydrological anomalies. So El Nino is a natural uh, climate oscillating phenomenon. You have El Nino years with intense droughts that should be more intense and La Nina years with intense floods that should be more intense. Um, now, what about the impacts on uh, rice? Uh, so during the dry season, uh, there is, of course, a decrease of rainfall. And also, uh, they are, there are upstream dams uh, that are keeping the water upstream of the delta. So logically, there is uh, a scarcity of fresh water in the delta during the dry season. And since there is a scarcity of fresh water in the Mekong River, and also the sea level is rising, you can imagine that the sea water, the salt water, is entering the Mekong River and it's going up the delta for several tens of kilometers. It can go very far away. And since uh, rice is an irrigated crop in this region, people have built a lot of canals to connect their fields with the water of the Mekong. And so the salt water also goes in these irrigation canals. So the water, the water becomes uh, brackish and the farmers have no other choice than to irrigate their fields with this brackish water which then makes an increase of field salinity and a decrease of rice yield ab above the critical threshold that I think my colleague will discuss. Uh, and so for example if you look at the yield trends, the yield data, uh, the past data in the Mekong Delta, you can see that uh, the main drops in yield like here for the blue and uh, the green curve, especially the, who are the winter and spring paddies, you can see that the main drops correspond to El Nino years. So with this intense growth, so there is a clear sign of the El Nino phenomenon. And also another issue is heat stress, because when you have a heat wave above 35 degrees, uh, this can cause a decrease of pollen fertility. So it's especially critical during uh, the flowering stage of a rice crop. And uh, this is another problem uh, related to dry season. Now for the wet season, the rainy season, there is of course an increase of rainfall, uh, pretty big increase. <laughs> and uh, this results in freshwater flooding. So in the first place, uh, this freshwater flooding can be seen as positive because they are flushing the salt away of, this, of the field. And also they deposit a layer of sediment, um, which is, uh, pretty good for soil fertility. But as I mentioned, people, a lot of people have built dikes around their fields to be able to make a third rice in the year, the autumn paddy. And so these high dikes often prevent this positive effect from flooding because they prevent the flooding from entering the field. And uh, then another, pro uh, another problem of the rainy season is uh, typhoons and floods who can damage a rice and also infrastructure and again uh, cause storm. So here in the data, you can see that uh, the main drops in yield, uh, for example, on the green and uh, the orange curve, spring and autumn paddies, uh, are often related to La Nina years with these intense uh, events. Now, this is a scheme summarizing everything. It's a bit complex. I will not describe it in detail, but you can see that you have natural hazards like typhoons, droughts, freshwater floodings, who are amplified in intensity and or frequency by climate change. There is the additional problem of sea level rise. And all these things interact with human activities, like building dikes, dams, extracting groundwater, and so on. And these uh, complex interactions uh, mainly influence one critical par parameter, which is saltwater intrusion in the data that has a very negative effect on rice yield and rice growing area. So to summarize, the main issues faced by the, by the, faced, sorry, by the Delta are during the dry season, drought, uh, freshwater scarcity that causes saline intrusion. During the rainy season, floods and typhoons uh, that damage rice. And all this is the result of complex interactions between natural hazards amplified by climate change and human activities. And actually, in the past data, we can have clear sign of El Nino and La Nina years impact on rice yield. But of course, it's a natural phenomenon, so we cannot link it with climate change with certainty. But all we can say is that climate change and sea level rise 
should amplify all these problems and so uh, should pose a threat for rice crop uh, in the future. So now that I've talked about the problem, I let my colleagues uh, talk about the solutions. Hello, so we will present you some uh, adaptation solution that we identified. So as uh, it was exposed uh, in the previous uh, presentation, there are several adaptation levels. Uh, so first is an incremental adjustment of technologies and practices within a prevailing system. And then there are system-based adaptation that are at larger scale. And that uh, we'll see later, but that implies that, for example, crop diversification, climate smart agriculture. And then there is transformational adaptation, which is land use changes and migration, but we'll focus on the two first because we want to focus on uh, agronomic uh, interventions. Uh, so first, and one of the most common uh, agronomic interventions is the selection of rice varieties. Um, so development and diffusion of high yielding cultivars with stress tolerance capacities is very important. So for instance, uh, the um, capacity to, uh, to be tolerant to submergence and stagnant food and drought, so it's either uh, with single or combined traits. So the table here summarizes the identified threats uh, associated with each uh, season crops. So for instance, the winter crops uh, should combine traits that are both uh, submergence for the submergence tolerance traits for the early season and um, tolerance to drought for the late season. And then also, as we saw before, there is a big issue with the salt water intrusion. So the crops should be resistant to uh, salinity. And uh, so there is a threshold identified at uh, around 2.5 uh, grams per liter in the soil uh, salinity. And after that, uh, rice yields start to decrease. Um, also, it's important to have varieties with uh, different cycle lengths, and including short ones, because when you can uh, control the cycle lengths and shorten them, uh, you can ensure for the dry season to um, secure harvest before food, because foods arrive at the end of the season. And for the winter, winter crops, that usually ends in March, and uh, March uh, faces big uh, salinity issues. Uh, then if you can harvest before, it's, uh, it's, uh, you can have better uh, yields. And also it's a prerequisite for the rice stream system that we'll uh, present to you later. Uh, so there are some uh, ongoing and past projects that were conducted by the IRIS, so it's the International Rice Research Institute. And there is one uh, project that's called CLUES that uh, works on uh, submergence and salinity uh, tolerance. So we feel very related to this project. Um, and they use the marker assisted uh, back crossing uh, techno technology. So it's uh, identifying qualitative traits, uh, locus traits. So a specific uh, section of DNA associated with uh, addressing uh, gen uh, genotypes uh, and interesting for the needs. So for example, submergence tolerance, uh, drought tolerance, and then introducing them in a rice variety of the Mekong Delta. Uh, and some promising lines were identified. So some with short growth duration, tolerant to a anaerobic seedling stage. So it's when you have stagnant food, but you still want the, the rice to grow or some uh, with submergence and salinity tolerance and other with high yield and salinity tolerance. And this one is interesting because it even has a um, higher yield than um, some very popular uh, varieties that are currently used. Uh, there was another project, the Nadina project that was uh, run between 2008 and 2018. And uh, it was quite successful because they could disseminate uh, the varieties throughout the Mekong Delta and the two, are, two of the new varieties were already registered at national level and six other are being registered. Uh, so we mentioned earlier the, um, the heat uh, stresses and uh, indeed uh, the heat stresses they is correlated with a decrease in the, in the yield and the ideal temperature in uh, Vietnam for a rice to flourish is between 27 to 32 degrees. Uh, but then above 34 degrees, uh, you have spike late fertility. And even if one hour uh, above 34 degrees, then the, it induces a, a spike late fertility. Uh, 
Um, and the rice furrowing stage is the most critical because if the heat stress happens during the rice furrowing stage, it's when you have fertility. Um, and it causes uh, pollen uh, inhibition and pollen uh, infertility. Uh, so there are two solutions identified. So first, some um, heat tolerant cultivars. And so the, um, the solution is when you, uh, um, you compensate with a lot of pollen on the stigma. Uh, so this compensates with the loss of uh, pollinization during the growing stage. And uh, so that was developed by the uh, International Rice Research Institute. And otherwise, you have the early morning flowering trait, the um, EMF, that was uh, identified. And so usually the rice um, flowers, um, so we call that the anthesis, at uh, noon. Uh, and so at noon, it's the temperature is very high. So the early morning flowering trait would shift the flowering stage early in the morning when the water is cooler. Um, yes. So now we can move on uh, adaptation strategy concerning the water management. And one of them is the wastewater reuse. So wastewater reuse can be seen as a research, research uh, which provides uh, an adaptation to climate change, especially during the dry season with uh, water scarcity. So a study was done in Kanto City to see the impact of the wastewater reuse. And according to those results, Uh, if all uh, wastewater has been reused in this city, it will provide up to 28% of the irrigation uh, water demand on the Alibuya, which is not negligible. Um, at the same time, uh, depending on the nitrogen and phosphorus um, concentration remaining in the, in the water, it can provide up to 20 to 35% of the nitrogen requirement and up to 10 to 25 of the phosphorus requirement. So um, if all uh, wastewater uh, from this study has been uh, reused, uh, it can save money uh, for farmers, both on irrigation costs and also on fertilization costs. But uh, it is necessary to mention that the wastewater treatment is relatively uh, costly. So wastewater we use uh, in the agriculture, agricultural sector has good potential uh, as climate change adaptation uh, strategy that addresses uh, the increases uh, in water scarcity and the salt water inclusion, but which is relatively costly. So an, another <laughs> adaptation strategy, which is really promising, is the alternate wetting and drying. So uh, what is that? It's an irrigated rice management used to cultivate uh, rice with uh, less water than the traditional system of continuous flooding of the rice field. Um, it's a method of control and intermittent uh, irrigation, and it's defined by the periodic uh, drying and refloating of the field, uh, which allow uh, the field to dry um, for a few days before re-irrigation without stressing the plants. So how do we implement this method? So we use a water tube made of PVC or bamboo uh, of eight centimeters of diameter and 30 centimeters long with perf perforation in bottom 20 centimeters. So the purpose of the tube is to measure the water availability in the field below the soil surface. So the pipe is installed in such a way that uh, the bottom 20 centimeters uh, of perforated uh, portion remain below the soil surface and the non-perforated uh, top part uh, remained above the soil surface. The perforation permits the water to come inside the tube from the soil uh, where, uh, where there is a scale uh, that is used to measure water depth uh, from the surface. So how does it work? So um, after the irrigation of the crop field, the water depth uh, will gradually decrease because of different uh, processes like evapotranspiration and percolation. And when the water level drops uh, 50 centimeters uh, below the soil surface, the threshold uh, for which the ability of roots to capture water from the saturated soil is prevented, uh, irrigation should be um, should be applied to reflow the, uh, the field to uh, five centimeters above the surface. So the number of days uh, uh, of non-flooded uh, soil between irrigation 
uh, is depending and can vary from one to 10 days, depending on different factors, such as the soil type, the weather, and the crop growth stage. There is one condition to implement this method, is that during the flowering stage, the field should be keep flooded. And after the flowering stage, um, like uh, the water level is allowed to drop below the soil, uh, below the soil surface until 15 centimeters uh, before uh, we irrigate another time. So what are the benefits of this method? So by reducing the number of, ev um, of irrigation events required, alternate wetting and drying uh, can uh, reduce the water use up by 30%. So it can help farmers cope with water scarcity during the dry season. Um, it is necessary to mention that alternate switching and drying does not reduce uh, yield uh, if it's implemented correctly and uh, may in fact increase the yield by promoting uh, more efficient and a stronger wood uh, growth of the rice. Um, moreover, uh, farmers can, um, can save money on irrigation costs. And in addition to be uh, an, ad an adaptation to climate change, uh, it's also a climate change mitigation measure since uh, it reduces around 48% of the methane emission. Um, so then there are other adaptations in the redesigning of the cropping system. And uh, so one uh, option is the alteration of the cropping schedule. So uh, in sense, you can uh, avoid the late sensibility um, uh, season. So uh, especially for salt water intrusion. So for the winter crops that usually end in March to April and that start in November to December, uh, you should shift the date one month before. Uh, and then you can harvest uh, one month before and avoid the salinity intrusion because the salt water intrusion reaches their peak at the peak of the dry season uh, in uh, in April. Uh, so it's been shown that uh, this uh, goes with an increase in yield per farmer and per hectare, and also in yield in, uh, in total income. Um, and that should go along also with the, uh, giving the good um, rice varieties and having a good monitoring of the growth, uh, the growth season and to uh, settle the proper cut-off date and sowing date. Um, yeah. Um, also, so as we saw, uh, a lot of triple cropping has been uh, implemented, triple rice cropping has been implemented in the Mekong Delta, uh, but uh, it has high sensitivity to uh, climate change impacts because it has a high reliance on agrochemical because, uh, because of dikes, uh, you don't have the fresh water flooding and uh, giving new sediments. Uh, it requires high irrigation during the, uh, the dry season because it's a uh, high dikes, and it also requires high pumping capacity during the flood season. And uh, since you have those three crops, each crop uh, on the total annual production, uh, it's uh, sensitive to all the uh, climate change risks uh, associated with each season. So it's highly dependent also on production cost. And so the, um, it's a high, if you uh, highly affect one of the crops in the year, it can affect the farmer's income at the end of the year. Uh, so uh, one good adaptation strategy would be to replace, replace one of the crop by upland uh, crops with a higher market value. So either uh, cash crops or perennial crops. Uh, so in this, um, as we'll see just after, this improves the farm economic resilience to climatic stress. And also it improves the farm uh, profitability. Um, so yeah, as we saw, monoculture rice is associated with a lot of risk. So to diversify the, produ uh, uh, the production towards cash crops or perennial crops, cash crops are crops that uh, they need to be uh, re replanted every, every year and perennial crops that don't need to be replanted every year. Um, so then there is less sensitivity to uh, rice cultivation uh, um, linked to uh, salinity. It uh, diversifies the sources of income. It also it increases the incomes of the farmers. Uh, so our recommendation is to identify some context-specific multipurpose stress tolerant trees and crops. Um, so really, it's a local. You need to um, 
study the, the local needs and uh, climatic uh, conditions. So here we can see some, a list of uh, different uh, cash crops and terminal crops and what they are tolerant to. For instance, mango, you'll plant it in a, during a season where uh, the, the ecological zone will be uh, sub subjected to drought. Um, same for coconuts, etc. Okay. So one example of mixed farming strategy is with aquaculture is the rice shrimp system, which is based on the rice shrimp symbiosis. So both rice and shrimp are grown in the same aquatic ecosystem and uh, both benefit from this, which creates a, a mutualistic relationship. So the rice provides uh, the shrimp with a shelter and a shade, uh, which reduces the temperature of the water, which is creating a more suitable environment for the shrimp. Uh, shrimp also benefit the herbivorous uh, insects uh, on the rice, uh, with, by having an additional food source. And on the other hand, uh, shrimp reduces insects, pests, disease, and weeds. And by controlling uh, weeds, the competition for nutrients is reduced between uh, rice and uh, weeds, which, um, which uh, allow to have more uh, nutrients available for the rice. The soil fertility is also strongly affected by the shrimp integration, which means um, like because of the shrimp manure, which is a good uh, organic fertilizer, uh, which means higher concentration of soil organic matter in the soil. So overall, the integration of uh, the shrimp in rice fields maintains soil health, uh, organism biodiversity, productivity, and production sustainability. And according to some studies, the integration of shrimp uh, has increased incomes over several uh, consecutive seasons for farmers uh, and compensate for the yield losses due to the saltwater intrusion. So here, uh, there are three ways to implement this method. So the first one is the alternate culture, where you have during the wet season only rice and on the dry season, because the conditions are less suitable for the rice, you, you grow shrimp. The second way to implement is to have an integrated culture where you have simultaneously rice and shrimp, like during the wet season, you grow rice. And at the end of the wet season and the beginning of the dry, you introduce shrimp. And you can also do it like mixed culture, where you have both shrimp and rice during the wet season and during the dry season, only shrimp. Okay. Here you can have uh, an uh, illustration of how does it work. Like on the first one, you have uh, both uh, rice and shrimp on the field. And when rice paddy is harvested, uh, you allow the, um, the shrimp to come in the field and to eat the leftover of the rice. For coming to the conclusion, so adaptation to climate change requires hard and soft policy options. So we define hard policy option as the construction of uh, hydraulic infrastructure, dams, road gates, canals, uh, and soft policy options, or uh, include everything that we showed you, so climate smart agriculture, so monitoring the sowing cut of dates, uh, agriculture extension, diversification. Uh, so uh, the um, to, to have an efficient uh, adaptation strategy, you need to redesign the global um, cropping system by mixed farming strategies, so rice, shrimp, agriculture, or uh, double rice with upland crops, uh, more with um, some uh, um, cut-off dates that are suitable to avoid salt water intrusion <coughs> or flood, and also a better monitoring of water flows and salinity. So then if you uh, monitor that well, you can diffuse the information to the farmers that can then adapt and do their adjustments. Uh, but that must go along with thematic adjustments for specific problems, such as the def def development and diffusion of new rice varieties, as uh, we showed you, uh, with the better water management, including the alternate wetting and drying, and uh, with uh, the alteration of the, the cropping schedule. And Thank you for your attention.